him. Uh, if you would, stand with me for the reading of God's word. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 through 28. And this is the final ending section of this letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Hear what Holy Scripture says. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for what has already transpired this morning, that we have heard a call to worship, we have spent time in prayer, we have sang or sung songs to you, and now we come to the preaching of your word. And Father, we pray and we ask, even as Paul prayed for the Thessalonians, that you would be at work in our midst to sanctify us completely, even in these moments here this morning. We pray and we ask that you would be at work in our midst by your Holy Spirit, because otherwise, my words and our efforts will just fall completely flat. We need you, O oh God, to work in our midst by your Holy Spirit to make us a holy people who are committed to your holy purposes and who are being conformed to a holy character. Would you help us, O oh God, to appreciate the gospel afresh? Would you renew our mind so that we understand that what is taking place here this morning is far more than just a mere social and religious club, but that we are the blood-bought people of the living God through his Son, the Lord Jesus, who, is, who are indwelt by the Spirit. And so I pray that we would experience those realities here this morning. We desperately need you, O oh God. We are broken, weak, and frail people who can do nothing apart from our Lord Jesus. And so we pray for your aid and for your assistance this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to begin this morning by sharing an account from the life of John Payton. The Scotsman who went to minister the gospel to the cannibalistic people of the New Hebrides, also known as modern-day Vanuatu. And it is an account of a parting, of a farewell in the life of John Payton. Payton was leaving home to attend divinity school and become a city missionary. And the walk from his hometown to the train station was a 40-mile walk. And so his father accompanied him for the first six miles on that day. And Peyton, recounting this farewell, recounting this part parting with his father several decades later, records that day in these words. And it's a lengthy excerpt, but I hope that it's helpful for us. My dear father walked with me the first six miles of the way. 
His counsels and tears and heavenly conversation on that parting journey are fresh in my heart as if it had been but yesterday. And tears are on my cheeks as freely now as then whenever memory steals me away to the scene. For the last half mile or so, we walked on together in almost unbroken silence. My father, as often was his custom, and carrying hat in hand with his long flowing yellow hair streamed like a girl's down his shoulders. His lips kept moving in silent prayers for me, and his tears fell fast when our eyes met each other in looks for which all speech was vain. We stopped on reaching the appointed place of saying goodbye, the parting place. He grasped my hand firmly for a minute in silence, and then solemnly and affectionately said, God bless you, my son. Your father's God prosper you, And keep you from all evil. Unable to say more, his lips kept moving in silent prayer. In tears we embraced and parted. I ran off as fast as I could and went about to turn a corner in the road where he would lose sight of me. I looked back and saw him still standing with head uncovered where I had left him, gazing after me. Waving my hat in adieu, I was round the corner and out of sight in an instant. But my heart was too full and sore to carry me any further. So I darted into the side of the robe and wept for a time. Then, rising up cautiously, I climbed a dike to see if he yet stood where I had left him. And just at that moment, I caught a glimpse of him climbing the dike and looking out for me. He did not see me. And after he has gazed eagerly in my direction for a while, he got down, set his face toward home, and began to return, his head still uncovered, and his heart, I felt sure, still rising in prayers for me. I watched through blinding tears till his form faded from my gaze, and then hastening on my way, vowed deeply and oft, by the help of God, to live and act, act so as never to grieve or dishonor such a father and mother as he had given to me. Payne will go on to say how this entire account of their parting was often brought to his mind. It helped him to fight temptation. It helped him to labor in his studies. And I'm sure that it helped him while he was on the mission field eventually in the New Hebrides. And today in our passage, we have Paul's farewell words in this letter. Words that convey no new information, but words that carry significant weight because they are his last words, his final words, words that are are intended to leave us with an impression, words that are meant to be ringing in our minds and ears as we say goodbye to the Apostle Paul and to this letter. So what is it that Paul says here? What is on his heart and mind as he comes to the end of the papyrus? What lasting impression does Paul want to leave upon the Thessalonians and upon us? Taking notes this morning, I have a very simple outline. Three points out out of these five verses or six or whatever it is. Three points, a simple outline, a final prayer, final instructions, and a final word. First, a final prayer. And we see this in verses 23 and 24. The prayer is this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word sanctify, as you, many of you would know, means to set apart. You might think of a professional hockey player. He is intentional in the food that he consumes, He has a regimented training and practice schedule, right? He would be extremely careful 
in other activities that he participates in lest he get injured, right? That's probably written in his contract. We would say that the athlete's body is set apart for hockey. And in much the same way, a Christian's entire existence is set apart for God and for God's purposes in his or her life. And I want us to notice a few things from the text. Uh, The way that Paul talks about our being set apart here is helpful. It's instructive. First, note that it is a complete or holistic sanctification. The uh, well-known British Anglican uh, preacher of the past century, and, and I, you know, he functioned into the 21st century as well. John Stott says this, that it is a sanctification that is through and through. It, it is a sanctification that is through and through. If we want to expand upon that slightly, we would say that this sanctification reaches every part of who we are, every aspect of our, of, of our lives, and no part is to be left excluded. We would also say that there is a balance and a proportion to this sanctification. The golden sanctification is for all the virtues to be found in the life of a believer. Just to to give a negative example of this, sometimes, particularly young men, uh, maybe they're not, uh, they haven't been Christians for very long, but they'll get a hold of something like Reformed theology, and they'll get really passionate about a certain system of doctrine, and they'll start reading lots of books, theology textbooks, listening to preachers on YouTube, and they'll be really passionate about theology, and their theology is probably largely correct. But then there's these other areas of immaturity or, or, or unhealth in their lives. And so, so there, what we're saying is that that's great young man, that you want to pursue doctrine, but we also want to see growth in every area of life. We want you to be balanced in your sanctification, which doesn't happen overnight. And this is what Paul is saying. He wants believers to be sanctified through and through in every area of life. And then notice with me, and it's kind of saying the same thing, but this is a sanctification of the entire person. There's been lots of ink spilt over these verses. There's debate about whether we are dichotomous beings. That is, are we two parts? Or are we trichotomous beings? Are we three parts? And you can obviously see why there would be debate because there's the mention of spirit, soul, and body in this verse. And so trichotomous would appeal to this verse to say that human beings are made up of three distinct parts. Now, I do think that that discussion, though, can distract us from the thrust of what Paul's saying here. I think Paul's saying here is that the whole person, both immaterial and material, both spiritual and physical, the spirit, soul, and body of Christians would undergo sanctification. Your whole being, your whole person... We'll get into that in just a moment, but he's, he's not saying, okay, as long as your actions are okay, it doesn't matter what's going on in your heart. As long as you don't act out on the evil desires of your heart, that's okay. That's not what Paul's saying. No, your entire person, body, soul, and spirit is of concern to our God. And perhaps I'm saying this to people who already know this, so you will forgive me if this is not new information for you, but God is concerned about our actions, but he's also concerned about our hearts. He's concerned that we not lash out in cutting and harsh words towards other people, but he's also concerned that our hearts are loving towards those that wrong us. He is displeased when we steal things, right? But he's also displeased when we covetously wish for things that do not rightly belong to us as if uh, uh, that we want those things for ourselves. It is envy or covetousness. God is displeased both when we steal things and when we want to steal things. It is a bad thing to view pornography on our phones, the action But Jesus talked about sexual immorality of the heart in the first century, meaning that we can commit adultery in our hearts without any screen or device to help us. This might sound harsh or severe, 
But I want you to know that this is immensely good because the version of God that many people in the West have by default is, oh yeah, I believe in some higher being. Which like, I don't, like, like that's so like, I mean, I understand, you know, people are religious by nature and in some sense it's a good thing that they believe in a higher being because then you can have a religious conversation with them. But it's like, you know, like is this higher being like bubblegum in the sky? Like I don't, there's, there's no content to it, there's no definition to it. I believe in a higher being. But anyways, I, I believe in a higher being, bubblegum in the sky. I, I think that he has some level of power, so he's probably a little bit more powerful than bubblegum, who has some moral standards. But, and here's the kicker, for so long as we are decent people who do our best, best that's sufficient for this casual de- deity that some people supposedly believe in. Most people believe in a deity in the sky in sort of vague terms because that God is for them and behind them and approving of them. But the true God, my friends, is concerned not just that we tidy up our actions when other people are watching. The true God is not okay with our version of being a decent person. The true God is not Uh, satisfied with the culture's uh, expectations of what constitutes a decent man or woman? No, the true God is concerned that his people live lives of holiness in the innermost parts of their being. Before I was saved, and I was saved at age 17, uh, so, you know, all, all throughout my childhood, all throughout my junior high years, senior high years, I was not saved, except for my final year, because I was saved in the 12th grade. Uh, I was a mean-spirited kid. And I would often, particularly in elementary school, uh, remember being called into the principal's office for bullying, you know, my peers, classmates. Um, And so I was just not, I was an unkind kid, and I was a mean-spirited child. Uh, But there there would be these short snippets where I would choose to be kind. I don't know what came over me. But I would choose to be kind with those that I interacted with. And it felt good. So I would do that for a bit. But it would never last. It was just a, it was just a short, shallow behavioral change that lasted for a week at most. And it was motivated because it felt good for me rather than out of a desire to love others and to love God. And perhaps you have experienced something similar. Whether you are a Christian or or you're an unbeliever here in our midst, perhaps you have experienced something similar. You have tried to do good. You have tried to be better. You have tried to clean up your act, to get your life together. But at the end of the day, here is the deal. You cannot change your heart. You cannot make lasting changes to your life that is pleasing to God, and you cannot make changes that reach the deep crevices of your heart. You see, all religions are not equal. Very superficially, the major world religions do have some semblance of similarity in morality, but where the power to conform to that morality comes from is very different in the Christian religion. I would presume, and I'm not an expert on other world religions, but I would presume to say that most world religions would tell you that here are the standards and here are the rules. Now work hard to conform. But here is the beginning point of genuine and true Christianity. Yes, it is true that Christianity has rules and it has laws and God has standards But the first thing that God says to you if you're sitting here this morning and you're considering these things is that you cannot do it at all. And when you try, you will make a mess of things. And listen to me, young man, young woman, old man, old woman, that if you are here and you're trying to conform to the standards of Almighty God, you will fail miserably every single time. Because, as I have just been going on about, God is concerned not just that our actions are clean, not just that our public life is tidied up, but he's concerned at the very level of the heart. 
If we are honest with ourselves, we do not have good hearts. We do not have hearts that are full of righteousness and selflessness and love towards God, but we are naturally bent towards idolatry and towards selfishness. You cannot make yourself better. You cannot change yourself. You cannot make yourself become a more holy person. That might sound harsh, but I just want to be clear because there was a, a while ago when I preached, I felt like I preached my heart out and, uh, you know, trying to preach about the gospel and the scriptures, and then someone came up to me who was a complete, completely not a Christian, would reject Christ, would reject the gospel, and she said to me, you know, you're so inspiring. And I <laughs> But she wasn't inspired because of maybe the things I was saying. I think she was just inspired because maybe I was like, you know, passionate up here or whatever. So I just want to be very clear. Friend, out of love for God, out of concern for you, that if you're in this room and you are trying your very best to clean up your life out of your own resources, out of what you can do, let me tell you that the Bible says to you that you cannot And that's why Paul ends the letter the way that he does. He has encouraged the Thessalonians towards sanctification. He has called them to live a life of holiness. And he exhorted them to be sp- not to be spiritually drunk, but to be sober. And he has instructed them to live a life that is worthy of the name Christian. But Paul who is the most significant theologian the church has ever known, understands the impotence of man to change his own heart. You know, there's a lot of, you know, ologies in Christian theology and Christian doctrine. So we think of like Trinitarian theology, or we think of the doctrine or the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, so Christology. Or you think of the doctrine of man, so that would be anthropology, or you think of the doctrine of sin, that would be hamartiology. You think of the doctrine of salvation, soteriology. You think of the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. Or you think of the doctrine of last things, eschatology. But there's a, and, and, and it's important for us to have an understanding of all of those ologies. It's important for us to be um, believing rightly in all those categories. But there is a sub-doctrine, a particular aspect of theology that is immensely important for you to grasp if you're going to succeed at the Christian life. That's worded intentionally. It, 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 there is a sub-doctrine that is immensely important for you to grasp if you are going to succeed at the Christian life. And the reason for this is twofold. Number one, this doctrine affects your life. It affects every moment of every day, and it affects every relationship in your life. It affects your emotional and psychological health, as well as your spiritual maturity. And second, reason why it is important to get this doctrine right is because we so often get it wrong, and it's easy for us to do so. The doctrine that I'm talking about is the doctrine of sanctification. The doctrine of sanctification literally affects every moment of your every day of your entire existence as a believer in the Lord Jesus, and it is so very easy for us to get it wrong. For example, and and I'm talking now about people who are Christians or who call themselves Christians. I'm not necessarily addressing the unbeliever in these moments, but I'm talking about those who would identify themselves as followers of the Lord Jesus. So how is it that we can get this doctrine of sanctification wrong? Some people say, Pastor, I know. They have an I know sanctification. Um. Lots of people think that they can improve themselves in their own strength, okay? Jesus has saved them. He has given to them eternal life. Jesus has set them on a new path, and so my job is to walk down that path. So, so, so you can think of maybe a, a young man who knows what the Bible teaches. You might think of a young man who, who knows what is right and wrong according to the Scriptures, And they think that's sufficient to simply know what the Bible teaches. Because after all, many people in our culture and society seem to not even know what the Bible says. At least I know what the Bible teaches. 
But they find themselves, remember this is a young man, find themselves being greatly allured by the lusts of the flesh, greatly enticed by the pleasures of the world. And they can hang on for a bit, but they give in. And they start to fail and fail again and, and fail yet again. And so they become discouraged and feel like throwing in the towel. And the error that this young man has made, he says that, well, pastor, I know what the Bible says, and that seems to be a sufficient uh, solution to my sanctification. Or here's another error. Your life is pretty put together. You're still married. Your kids are in one piece, and you're a decent person. After all, you know, it, and, and I'm not trying to make any judgment statements, but usually Christians have their, at least externally, their act together a little bit better than maybe people out in society and culture. But your temptation might be towards legalism and self-righteousness. You, you might say things like this, yes, I make mistakes, but I'm not as bad as those people over there. I cannot believe the behavior of young people these days. And I don't know exactly how this works itself out in your heart and mind, but maybe you think thoughts like this. I am the kind of person that always looks out for others. So you think that your holiness is predominantly about being better, slightly better, by the way, than other people. Or still, here is yet another error. An error that is probably the most tricky and the most subtle, but it goes like this. It's quite the opposite of the legalist. Pastor, we believe in grace around here. We don't believe in rules. It's a, it's a relationship, not a religion. Don't tell me about God's commandments. The Christian life, man, it's all of grace. The only thing we need to do is to think about the cross and the gospel, and God will do the rest. And this last one sounds spiritual. It appears theological. It smells biblical. But it is wrong. These people think that sanctification simply just happens because Jesus paid it all. But the Bible is clear, my friends. That Christians are to exert themselves and put forth effort in their own sanctification... Paul says that every believer should know how to control his or her own body in holiness and in honor in chapter 4. And we are not simply automatons that are controlled by the Spirit, irrespective of what we choose to say, think, or do. Yet, at the same time, none of that is even remotely possible if God were not at work in our lives to sanctify us. And that's why this verse is so instructive at the end of this letter, after Paul has exhorted the Thessalonians to pursue their own sanctification, he prays to God that God would sanctify them. So biblical sanctification then is not a let go and let God theology. It is also not an I can and I will theology. No, in biblical sanctification, we must hold these twin truths together. It's a seeming paradox to us because we are finite in our minds and in our ability to think. But you must do these two things. You must put forth intentional effort to pursue holiness. And second, you must rely entirely upon God to bring about sanctification in you. That's how we ought to approach and think about the doctrine of sanctification. Paul ends his final prayer with deep-seated confidence in the living God. He says, Paul says, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. And what is it that he will do? It's probably not that he's going to get you what you want for Christmas. It's probably not that he's going to make all your circumstances turn out the way that you want them to. It's probably not even a reference here to God helping you overcome temporal difficulties in your life. No, I think first and foremost, according to the context, what, God, what Paul is saying is that the God who has called you to his own glory and grace 
will be sure to complete the redemptive work that he began in you. That God, if you are truly in the Lord Jesus, will fulfill and complete his purposes in your life for the sake of of the Lord Jesus. Namely, that if you are in Christ and if God has begun his work in you, then our confidence that we will be sanctified and that we will stand holy and blameless before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ one day, holy and blameless, is because he will surely do it. God is faithful to do what he has promised. And he's able to bring about his redemptive work in your life. The powers of hell and Satan himself. And perhaps it's important for me to say this in a gathering of this size. Even your own failures cannot stop him. God is our confidence. And that's where Paul leaves us as he concludes this letter. So that's Paul's final prayer. Let us look quickly now at Paul's Final instructions. Paul's final instructions. We see this in verses 25 through 27. And uh, this is just a list, a bit of a, a list of things that the Thessalonian church is to do. And again, the corporate life of the church is highlighted here. Three times in three verses, Paul refers to the Thessalonian believers as brothers. In modern parlance, we would easily be able to say brothers and sisters. It's not meant to be a, 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 a male reference here. It's just meant to be a, a reference to all of the brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus in Thessalonica. Three verses, three mentions of the word brothers, and three instructions. Let's look at these briefly. First, Paul says, pray for us. Paul says, pray for us. Three times he has prayed for them, and now he asks for their prayers for him. And I think Augustine captures the spirit of this well. He said on one occasion to his church, he, you know, Augustine was the, uh, the North African pastor, uh, the Bishop of Hippo, uh, functioning uh, you know, roughly in the 4th century. And he says this, Let us offer prayers for one another. Let my prayers be offered for you and let yours for me. And brethren, do not think that you need my prayers, but I have no need of yours. And then he goes on, if the apostles used to ask for prayers on their own behalf, how much more does it behoove me to do the same? So a simple application is this. Please pray for us as your elders and pastors. We desperately need your prayers. We are weak and frail and need God's help, guidance, and wisdom if we are to lead this church well. Please pray for us. Pray for the ministry staff of this church by extension. Pray for the ministry staff. Pray for the elders. Pray for the deacons. Pray for our sanctification. Pray for the salvation of our children, the strengthening of our marriages. Pray for opportunities to minister the gospel. And pray that God would use us to comfort, encourage, and strengthen you in your faith. It's a team effort in this sense. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Second, <laughs> there is this matter of the holy kiss. Verse 26, read all the brothers with a holy kiss. You know, I was thinking of the headline, you know, new, new pastor resurrects ancient practice of kissing at local Baptist church. <laughs> so that's not what I want to seek to do, but here we go. In the Greco-Roman world, kissing was a much more common form of greeting than it would be for us who live in the modern West. There are, of course, other cultures today if we, it, where it would be common to greet a friend or a family member with a kiss on the cheek or something similar. So I'm not saying it was just in ancient Greco-Roman times, but particularly if you grew up in Canada or in European nations, then, then a lot of them would, would just see kissing not as a form of greeting, Right? Um, so in Paul's day, kissing was a common way to show affection to family members and friends. And culturally, it was also a way to show honor and respect to officials, for example. Now, this kiss would be adopted into usage by the church. Clearly, it was practiced in Paul's day in the first century as a form of greeting. Okay? Then, in the second century, we learn from Justin Martyr, 
that the holy kiss was placed right before the communion. So it became a part of the liturgy or the, the order of service in a church. Because of the abuses of the practice, at least by the 4th century, th this kiss became more limited to men kissing men and women kissing women. And in the West, so in the Western church, some form of the holy kiss was part of the liturgy up until the third, 13th century when it fell out of use. So there's your historical theology of the holy kiss but the cultural considerations and its historic usage aside, to be clear, right, the kiss in the Christian assembly was meant to convey not romantic love, but familial love. And I'm just going to read this just so I'm careful with my words here, but it is a sign of affection and unity with the people of a given local church. In the way that we greet one another then, and I'm trying to apply this to our context, in the way that we feel towards and think about one another, there is to be a heartfelt love and a sense that we belong one to another because we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. To be clear, I think that there are cultural things to consider here. The point is to express affection and love towards your brothers and sisters in an appropriate manner. So... If we live in a culture where the kiss is really reserved between lovers, then a physical kiss might actually be counterproductive in communicating to another person, hey, I view you as my sister. Perhaps in our culture, then, it is a firm handshake or the Christian side hug, or if you're you know, greeting someone of the, the same gender as you, maybe it's a frontal hug. Or if you're part of the Spanish ministry, then you can go ahead and kiss one another. <laughs> I, I hope you understand what I'm getting at here. The point is... Warm, familial affection for other Christians. And the exact expression of that will differ from person to person, relationship to relationship, context to context. And I will leave that with you. <laughs> Third, Paul instructs the Thessalonians to have this letter read to the whole church in verse 27. Now, Paul probably had his reasons for wanting the whole church to hear the letter. Most people in the congregation would have been illiterate, so it just would have been a practical thing that someone would have had to get up, you know, up front and read the letter because it wasn't a culture like ours where everybody is able to read. He, he probably wanted the whole church to hear of his affection and affirmation of them and maybe there are sort of people on the fringes or maybe people who would feel like outsiders or maybe be excluded for whatever reason. I think Paul wanted to bring about unity in the church by bringing them all together, or at least for all of them to hear over the course of time this letter from the apostle to the Gentiles. But whatever the reason, Paul urged that this letter be read publicly to all the believers in the city of Thessalonica. And maybe you've wondered, why do we read Paul, but not Plato? Most of you probably haven't answered, asked that question, but why, why, why don't we read apocryphal works like the Gospel of Thomas? Or, or why don't we do a study like, uh, a study, study a church father like Augustine from the pulpit? Or, or this one is probably some, one that you guys would ask. Why don't we do a series on the latest Christian self-help book? I, I think that would be really helpful for some people. Well, there's a few reasons. First, let, it, let us be reminded that there was an expectation by the New Testament writers that their letters be read to the congregation. So we find this verse, Colossians 4.16 says this, and when this letter, when the Colossian letter has been read among you. Have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Revelation 1.3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. That's probably a reference to the public reading of the letter of Revelation. And then also, in the history of the church, Paul's writings have received prime of place in the public worship of Christians. And I hope you can appreciate the irony of this, but let me read to you from Justin Martyr. 
And what I'm going to read is basically an outline of a typical church service in the second century. So just one century removed from the time of Christ and the apostles. And I'm just going to read a portion of it, but let me read it to you. And on, on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place. And the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then... When the reader has ceased, the overseer verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. What I want you to notice is that very early, the public reading of the writing of the apostles became a mainstay of the public worship of Christians. To put it very simply then, when we read the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as part of our public worship, We are continuing, in a sense, a practice that arose out of a verse like this. It was continued by the church in the second century, which is documented for us by Justin Martyr, and has been practiced throughout the history of the church down to this very day. There is a reason, there's a rhyme and a reason reason why we do the the things the way that we do. There is a reason why we read portions of the Old and New Testaments from this pulpit and we expound on those uh, books and not on others. It is because throughout the history of the church, the 39 books of the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testaments have been understood and received as divine words. And it is to those books that we want to give our highest attention and allegiance. We've heard a final prayer, final instructions, and now a final word. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's verse 28. And let me uh, paraphrase Eros. The, The pastors will get together, or the pastoral staff will get together on Wednesday mornings typically, and we'll review uh, the previous week's sermon, and we'll look at the passage for the upcoming week's uh, sermon. And uh, this was a comment that Eros made, which I thought was um, punchy and helpful, so let me just read it. He said something along these lines. There is grace at the beginning, there is grace at the end. Speaking of the letter to the Thessalonians, it's all sandwiched in grace. You can't do it without him. I think it's good. It is from grace to grace. It is of grace and by grace. It is because of grace and on account of grace. Friends, your very being a Christian, your very belonging to this local church, it has nothing to do with your intellect. It has nothing to do with your spirituality. It has nothing to do with your morality, your wisdom, your abilities, or your accomplishments. The reason why you and I are Christians, the reason why you and I belong to this local church is because of the sovereign grace of the living God shown to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is who we are. This is our identity. This is our hope. This is our purpose. And there is no other hope. There is no other meaning in life than in the gospel of grace. This is who we are. I understand that in a room of this size that we, that we probably share lots of things in common. We might share, uh, I don't know, a common outlook on culture and the government. We are probably typically in here more conservative people. And we probably live according to a certain kind of lifestyle. And those things are good and not bad things. But deeper than that, more foundational than that, is that the people in this room who are in Christ are people who have been absolutely and radically transformed by the grace of God in His Son, the Lord Jesus. That's who we are a people broken and sinful, a people entirely undeserving, but a people who have been shown matchless grace and mercy, a people who are orphaned but now adopted into the family of God, a people who are aimlessly meandering in the darkness but have been shown the light, 
A people who are headed for eternal punishment, but who have been rescued by Jesus. A people who are forsaken and harassed by Satan, by the world, and even by our own flesh, but who are beloved by God and chosen by God from before the foundation of the world to belong to him. Church, that is our only hope. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Let's pray together. Father, we live in a broken world. We are broken people. We experience broken situations. We are in broken relationships. And so we desperately need the healing, saving, sanctifying power of the grace of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And so I just pray that you'd apply that bomb of the gospel to our hearts and to our lives here this morning, in the coming hours, and in the coming days. Would you sanctify us completely? And would you keep us to be blameless in body, soul, and spirit until the arrival and at the coming of the Lord Jesus? God, thank you for being gracious towards us. We are so thankful for your love, which forms us as a people. We love you, God, and we thank you for loving us first. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can rise as we...